Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you in again this morning. Nice buzz in the room. Great to see the brothers and sisters in Jesus. Great to undertake the wonderful discipline of going to church. Can I get an amen? amen. It's a place where we get built up, where we're, where we're encouraged. We're encouraged to live the life God has called us to live. Um, so it's a, it's a joy to be here. It's a joy to meet with people and get a hug and feel welcome to be part of God's community. Can I get a last amen? amen. Okay. I'm going to talk to you about the resistance I've been speaking about the resistance for the last couple of weeks uh, and the, vi the various forms that the resistance in your life takes. But you're saying, what is it resisting? This is what it's resisting. In whatever form it takes, the resistance is stopping you from living your life to become, stopping you from becoming fully alive. That's what it is. It's stopping you from becoming fully alive. I've looked already at a couple of the things that we face in terms of the resistance that is stopping us from becoming fully alive and fully walking in what God planned and purposed for us and for our lives. I've already looked at a couple of them. But I like what Thomas Aquinas, the early Christian writer, said. He said, the glory of God is man fully alive. When we are fully alive, God gets glory. That is how God is glorified. When we live fully in accordance with his pattern and with his plan. I was looking the last few weeks and I was talking about the trinity of evil that is arrayed against us. And they are the devil, the flesh and the world. Or the world, the flesh and the devil is probably the more familiar phrasing of it. And we were looking at how these different elements in our lives all resist us becoming fully, fully alive, to walking fully in the presence and the power and the intentions and the purposes of God. Now, in a briefest of recaps, I talked last week about a guy called John Mark Comer. He's an American Christian writer and preacher and a pastor in America. And uh, when he, I, I read a book of his recently and he described it in this way. This is how he said it works out in reality. So it's, he says it starts off with this, the devil introduces deceptive ideas into us, into our culture, into our society. But initially, they're spoken to us individually. And that's really important to remember. Individual lies are told to us. And then those desires, they play to the disordered desires that are at work inside us. Remember we talked about the flesh, the things, what I want to do is what I don't do, and what I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. And we discover that there's this battle, this tension, this tug of war that's going on within all of us, as the Bible calls it. The spirit and the flesh are at war within us. And then when those desires work their way out, they become normalized in a sinful world. And that's how he described the process by which the world, the flesh, and the devil are arrayed against us. The theologian uh, Thaddeus Williams uh, said, and they are the anti-trinity of evil that is arrayed against us. So we believe, we've sung about it just this morning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the trinity that we believe, that is for us. God is for us. Amen. Amen. But this is the anti-trinity that is arrayed against us. It is stopping us connecting with God. Stopping us walking in the full plans and the full purposes of God. And having spoken about the world and spoken about the flesh today, I want to talk about the devil. Now the reason I want to talk about the devil is because this is really important for Christians to hear and see what it is that we are up against. However, when we talk about the devil, in a strange way it has a diabolical effect on us. And I know I personally have felt it very much this week. I felt the pressure as I prepared this message this week. I knew that I was in a spiritual battle and so I prayed. So I'm going to ask you, before we look at God's word this morning, would we pray together? Amen. So that God would be glorified in this place and the enemy would be thrown down in our minds, in our hearts and in our lives. Amen. Would you stand with me for a moment? And you can raise your hands to heaven if you wish as we pray this morning. Father in heaven, we declare there is one God and Father and his son, Jesus Christ. There is one Holy Spirit, one church, one plan, one purpose of God for our lives. And we stand in that today, Lord. Today, Lord, we ask that the lives of the devil would be cast down in this place, Lord. Lord, that his plans and manipulations for the lives of people today would be cast down today. We pray that chains would be broken in our heads, in our hearts, and on our hands, Lord Jesus. We pray today that the devil will receive no glory, but God will get all of the glory. We pray, dispel the darkness in Jesus' mighty name, and God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 You know... Some of you who probably come in here this morning, you mightn't be familiar with the Christian faith. You mightn't be familiar with faith at all. And you might be scratching your head going, the devil? Really? These people believe that there is a devil? 
Well, you know what? Most people I've spoken to, in actual fact, everyone I've ever spoken to on this subject, has always agreed that there is a such a thing as evil. But the Bible talks about that evil being personified in the devil himself. In the fantastic movie from 1995, The Usual Suspects, a brilliant movie about how this mysterious and invisible criminal boss called Kaiser Sose went about his business. There is a scene in it in which a guy called Roger Kint, who himself may turn out to be Kaiser Sose, it's all a bit of a mystery, he says this. He says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. You see, if you go down the street there and you talk to most people, they say, the devil, ah, come on. What kind of nonsense is that? All oh, superstition. But the Bible is very clear. There is an enemy. It is personified in the devil. And so in, in another way, what happens is the devil is quite happy when he's dismissed or even if he's ridiculed. He loves the idea, this Dante-ish idea that he has horns and a cloak with a high collar and he has a, a kind of a tail with a point on the end of it and he has cloven hoofs. He loves us thinking like that because he knows that that's nonsense. We dismiss the devil in that way. We think, ah, you know, he's just a bit of a character. He's funny. We go to court devil to get a quote for our car insurance for heaven's sake. We go and we, we have, it doesn't matter. The devil, he wants to be dismissed. He really appreciates it when he's dismissed. Here's what a certain writer said. He said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which all race, humans, can fall into about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. And the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors. They're equally happy with if they're dismissed or if we're panicking in fear that there's a devil under the bed. We're, they're, they're quite happy. Absolutely brilliant. Too much focus or no focus. They're absolutely delighted. And those are the errors that we fall into. Now that's a quote by a certain Irish writer who shall remain nameless because I was told that I can't say the words <laughs> C.S. Lewis anymore. <laughs> but he's the guy who wrote it, okay? Just for saying. But when we talk about the devil and dismissing the devil, there's so much, there's such a panoply of ways in which the enemy works in the world and the way he works in our lives. There's so many different ways. There's so much violence, so much, um, so much plunder, so much uh, violence, so much untruth. And the one thing that he, he deals in most above all else is lies. That's his main modus operandi. In the world that's the way he operates in the world and that is through lies now we could focus on many other things everything from demon possession to spirits in the heavenly places and all of that is true it's all true and it's all substantial but I can given the limited amount of time I have and given that we're speaking in the church we have the opportunity to focus on just one thing and that is what the devil does and what's in his nature and what's in his character what's the nature of his game as, the, as a Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones famously said. This is what Jesus said about the devil. Are you listening? Here's what he said. He said he was a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. That's what he does. He lies. He lies to you. He lies to me. He lies to our culture. He lies to the world. He lies about me. He lies about you. He lies about our culture. And if you look at the story of uh, the, the story in the account in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, in the garden where the very first lies are told and the first appearance of the serpent or the devil as the serpent is played out in Genesis chapter 3, we see the way that he operates is so subtle by raising questions and telling lies. Here's Genesis chapter 3. It says that the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals in the garden that God had made, referring to the devil. And this is what it says. It says, one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden. See it? Subtle. God didn't say that. And the woman knew that that's not what God said. Of course she said we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden. It's, the only, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. 
So God places them in the garden. And everything is there to eat. Everything is beautiful. Everything is good. Everything is theirs. Except one thing. Don't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that tree. That was God's only destruction. He said, if you eat it, you will die on that day. And you know, in, in, a, in a world where God has given us so much that we can enjoy, so much from which we can take pleasure, so many blessings all over our lives, why is it that we always want the one thing that we can't have? Why is that? Well, this is why. The devil tells the first lie, you won't die, the serpent said to the woman. You won't die. And this, to this day, the devil is telling the same lie. It's the lie that underlines all other lies. Have that crack cocaine, you won't die. Have that affair, you won't die. Have the 15th pint of stout, you won't die. That's the same lie he's been telling all along since then, right up to now. What your choice, your choice will not cost you. Your decision will not break you. Your, your decision will not lead you into addiction and destructive patterns and destructive patterns of behavior. You won't die, the devil said to her. God knows, I love this, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Line number two, God is holding out on you. God has good things that he's not giving to you. God actually is out to kill your joy, not to give you joy. God actually wants to spoil your happiness, not give you happiness. You know, every parent who's ever raised a child, and I've raised three of them, knows this. And I was a child myself, hard to believe, I know, but I was once. I didn't come up this size. I was a child once myself, and there was a time in my life when I thought my parents were holding out on me. They wanted something other than my happiness. And when I raised my own boys, they, uh, there was times when it was clear that they thought that I would just wanted to kill their joy, that I just wanted to spoil their fun, that I was holding out on some good thing. But here's the truth. I had to say to them so many times, I have never even once, as God is listening, never even once, held out from you or stopped you from having a good time just to be malicious. There were times when I stopped you from doing things for your own good. Amen. For your own good. And when God says, don't eat from the tree, it was for their own good. And it's the same for us. When God withholds things in our lives, it's for our own good. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? amen. If, you, if that door isn't opening, it's for your own good. If that situation is not working out the way you planned it, it's for your own good. He causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He's at work. But here's the thing. Here's the lie. The lie was you won't die. And then the lie is that God is holding out on you. I want to say it. Tom already said it this morning. God is for you and not against you. God is for you and not against you. That's what the scripture tells us. He is for us. So the devil tells three lies. He tells three types of lies. And these are the lies he tells. First are the lies he tells us about God. We've already looked at them. The second types of lies that he looks at are these. Lies about others. What's motivating other people? You see, Shawnee, the way he's looking at you, you know, he's just trying to get you. He's just trying to wind you up. That's where he's going. Or, well, worse still, when they tell you, that girl who works down in accounts, she's really into you. No, she isn't. Hallelujah. But he tells you lies about others. Sometimes they're malicious, and sometimes they're delicious. Sometimes they're malicious, and sometimes they're delicious. Tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies, tell me, tell me lies. Sometimes we want to hear those lies. You are so good looking, you are so charming, you are so good. You are so good. Sometimes we want to hear those lies, but normally it's lies about others that cause the main trouble for us. But of course, the last type of lie that, that the enemy tells us is lies about you. Lies about you. And all of us here have heard lies. All of us here have heard lies told about us. Whether they were whispered in our ear by the enemy in the dead of night. 
whether they were spoken to us by a teacher or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a parent, every one of us have heard lies spoken about us. If you've ever had someone tell lies, deliberate, intentional untruths about you, it really, really hurts. And the other thing it does is it makes you really, really angry. And I know because it's happened to me. When people tell lies about you, it's the worst kind. And it's the, but it's the ones that the devil tells us about you. You're useless. You're no good. You're stupid. You've no power. You're weak. You're not strong. You're a failure. Those are the lies that begin to knock around inside our heads. Doesn't matter what mouth they come from, they begin to move around in our heads and become an echo chamber in our lives. I gotta tell you this, I was gonna say it in the early service, but I didn't have the time. When I was a young boy, I was about nine years of age, and we played a game called Spin the Bottle. Has anybody here ever played Spin the Bottle? Yeah? Spin the Bottle, admit that you played it. So, we were playing Spin the Bottle, and there was you know, a bunch of us kids, and there was one girl there, she was the heartthrob for all of us. She shall remain nameless. Let's call her, give her, let's call her, uh, Groinia, right? So, so, I don't know if there's a Groinia here, my apologies. That, that wasn't her name. So, we were playing spin the bottle and, and, you know, it was turning and, you know, what happens is you spin the bottle and whoever the bottle points between those two have to kiss. Uh, you're holding and you're praying, you're waiting for the bottle to come your way. Well... What happens to me, we're sitting there playing this game for a half an hour and then suddenly the bottle spun and it turns and it's me and groin. <laughs> and my heart starts to speed up. I'm getting a kiss, man. This is going to be good. And groin looks at me and she says, I'm not going to kiss that ugly foxy rat. <laughs> It broke me. It was a lie. It was a lie. Amen. Amen. Here's the curious thing, and I say it with a smile on my face, but I want you to bear this in mind, because I think this is really important, believe it or not. About four weeks ago, and you know, I was telling my wife, because I was, up, I was up with Alma, we, we walked past this girl a few times where we walked near our home, and I met her, and I said, that's uh, such and such. That's, that's growing, yeah? My first love, darling. So as I'm going, out, going around and Groinia goes past, I tell the story, tell the Groinia, Groinia doesn't recognize me. <laughs> Four weeks ago, I heard that Groinia is dead. So 45 years after that lie was spoken, the person who told it is now gone. But the lie is still in my mind. And there are people here this morning there are people here this morning, a parent who has gone, lied, and it's in your head. A teacher who lied about you is dead, but it's still in your head. And you're still reinforcing that lie. I'm stupid, I'm useless, I'm lazy, I'm weak, I'm ugly, I have no worth. We break that lie in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't let the dead speak to the living. Can I get an amen? amen? Don't let the dead tongue speak lies into your life and into your mind. I declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to pray about that maybe a little bit later. Here's a guy, some of you will recognize him. His name is Joseph Goebbels. Joseph Goebbels was the was the uh, Minister for Propaganda for the Reich government from 1933 to 1945. And he was known as their, the most intelligent propagandist who ever lived. And here's what he said. He said, repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. And he's not saying something mystor mysterious. He's not saying something that's kind of mystical and magical. What he's saying is the reality that when we repeat a lie often enough, it becomes our reality. If I tell myself I'm stupid often enough, do you know what I'm going to become? Stupid. If I tell myself often enough that I'm too weak, do you know what I'm going to get? Weaker. If I tell myself that I'm useless all the time, do you know what I'm going to become to anyone? Useless. If you repeat the devil's lie, it'll become your reality. 
If you repeat the lies of others, if you repeat the lies that you're told and you continue to repeat them, you become shaped. Remember we talked about it last week? Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See God's truth, apply God's truth, believe God's truth, live God's truth. That's how we overturn the lies and resist the lies of the devil. What are you going to choose to do today? Are you going to believe a lie that was spoken over your life? Are you going to believe a lie that was spoken about you? And the curious thing about lies is this. Lies and the devil's lies, and I won't, won't stay on this for too long. They always appeal to our feelings and our desires. They very rarely appeal to actual facts. Very rarely. Because feelings and desires are the field in which he works. Because feelings are fake and desires are liars. I just had to have that girl, baby. It didn't mean anything. Oh, yeah? I just had to have that Barrett shot and I couldn't resist it. It's just a feeling. It's just a lie. Don't fall for it. Feelings are fake and desires are liars. No, some feelings are really important. I feel I love my wife and that's really important. And thankfully she feels like she loves me. Hallelujah. But not only that, but she lives it out. It's the reality in her life. But be careful of the desires that he whispers to. Be careful of the feelings that your enemy is whispering to. How do we as Christians face down the lies that we face? How do we face down and resist the resistance that comes against us in the form of the enemy's lies and tricks? When Paul writes a letter to the early Christians, he writes the letter to the early Christians in the, in the city of Ephesus. Now, if you read the birth of the church at Ephesus, it was born in violence. It was born in demonic oppression. It was born in rioting. It was born in trouble. But this church was born out of all of this trouble because God will always make a way. Hallelujah. And, he, and he, so he's writing later on in his life, he's writing to the, to the Christians in Ephesus, and what he tells them, you're very familiar with it, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, it's in Ephesus chapter 6, or sorry, in Ephesians chapter 6, he writes this, you'll be familiar with this, known as the whole armor of God. Now I don't want to go into the detail of it, because it's been gone into a million times, and I've gone into it a few times, but I do want to read the scriptures so that we can be built up and edified by what God says, amen? amen. So here's what Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, this means war, he says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Can I get an amen? amen? Be strong. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against your neighbor. It's not against your teacher. It's not against groin, yeah? It's not against flesh and blood. It's not against the fellow who cut you off in traffic or the person who forgot you this Christmas or the person who never said happy birthday or never texted you a thanks. Your struggle is not against them, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then he tops it off really importantly and he says, and pray in the spirit the odd time. Pray in the spirit when you feel like it. All the time. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. They're in the same battle as you. They need the prayers just as much as you need the prayers. And this is his description for how we are going to fight this battle against spiritual forces that are arrayed against us. And so what I want to do is just pull them very, very quickly together in just a moment. Just pull them through and start off with this one. So he tells them to put on this armor. And the first thing in the armor that he tells them to do is he tells them to tell the truth. Tell the truth. The, the belt of truth around your waist is about telling the truth. Because you know what happens if you don't wear a belt? 
Your pants is going to fall down. You'll be caught with your pants down if you tell lies. Are you with me? Just sort of quick question. Has anybody here ever told a lie? Just curious, I'm putting my hand up. Anybody here ever told a lie? So, that's interesting. About, about 75% of us have told a lie and admitting it. And the good news is that the other 25% who didn't put up their hand have just told a lie, so we're all telling lies. We've all told lies. Tell the truth. Even if it costs you, tell the truth. Let me give you some other examples. He says, live right. That's what the blessed prayer, like some people have the idea that you're going to pray on all this stuff and you're going to, oh, I'm putting on the breastplate of righteousness and I'm, t I'm putting on the belt. No, no, no. Tell the truth and live right. Hello? Stand strong. Don't be a weakling carried away by everyone. Oh, the next problem you go, oh, I don't know, can I follow the Lord at all? He says, stand strong in the gospel with the readiness that comes from the gospel, that God has a purpose and a plan. We'll have protective faith. Lift up faith in the face of trials and circumstances and of doubts and of distractions and of lies. Have protective faith. And then he says, very importantly, know and speak God's word. And I actually have these in slightly wrong order. He says, guard your thinking, wear the helmet of salvation, which means literally guard the way that you think. But I like the way he opens it with tell the truth. And then the last he says, know and speak God's word, which is the truth. The truth is our only defense against the lies of the devil. It's our only defense against the lives of the devil. And here he has these really practical, simple things that we should just live out our lives. But in the middle of it all, he says this. He says, pray. Pray. On all occasions, he says. Always pray. Somebody said to me, what should I pray about? I said, pray about everything. It doesn't matter. And the other thing to remember this is, if you are praying, you're already praying right. Don't worry about, I don't know, is this the right way to do it? Doesn't matter, just pray. Speak out, have the conversation. Tell God what you need and listen to what he has to say to you. It's that simple. That's what prayer is. But this I will warn you about. Don't wait until you feel like praying. Because if you feel, wait till you feel like praying, what will happen? Your body will resist it. The culture will resist it. There'll be another episode of that great series on Netflix. And the devil will resist it with his lies. It's a waste of time. You don't have time. You're too tired. You have so much to do. Oh, God doesn't, doesn't love me. Oh, I'm not good enough to pray. Oh, I've been such a sinner this week. Oh, I've told lies I can't pray. Don't wait until you feel like praying. Pray and then you will feel it. Because we act our way into feeling much faster than we feel our way into acting. Are you with me? So we do it and get the feelings afterwards. Amen. 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 We're nearly there, lads. Nearly there. One important thing to remember is this. When it comes to dealing with the devil, he is a fearsome adversary. He is a dangerous adversary. And we do not take him lightly. But we remember this. And this is really important. John wrote to the Christians in 1 John chapter 5, the early Christians. And he said this. This is really important. Because not a lot of people know this because they live in fear of the devil and what the devil might do in their lives or do in their homes. Here's what he says. He says, we know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, good. For God's son holds them securely and the evil one cannot touch them. He cannot touch them. He doesn't have free reign over your life. He doesn't have free reign in your home. The evil one cannot touch you when you are in God's hand. But that is predicated on the idea that we don't make a practice of sinning. That we don't carry on about our lives as though sin doesn't matter. As though disobeying God's instructions and his best way to live in our lives doesn't matter. So long as we're telling the truth, we're living right, then the devil cannot touch them. I'll go further. I'll go further. Jesus said to the apostles when he was sending them out, this is what he told them. He said, the devil is under your feet. This is what he said. He said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. No, he's not talking about actual snakes and actual scorpions. And to overcome all the power of the enemy, what will harm you? Nothing, Nothing will harm you. 
When you're standing and walking in Jesus' name, when you're standing and walking in God's purposes and God's plans, nothing can harm you. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Are we going to walk with our heads held high and our shoulders back and say, God is for me, not against me? Amen. Let me finish off with these verses from, from Romans. Sorry, we're nearly there, nearly there. Here's, and this is important. This is what Paul writes, the very last verse of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 16. He says, I want you to be wise about what is good, wise about what is good, but innocent about what is evil. In the way that you live, be wise about what's good, but be innocent about what is evil. And then he says this, God will soon, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Hallelujah. He will soon crush Satan under your feet if you're wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Now, let me point this out because I think, again, it's one of those misunderstandings about the scripture. People go, but hang on, hang on a minute. Don't we always say that Jesus overcame the devil and he defeated the devil and therefore we have that victory? That is correct. There are three defeats that the enemy suffers, believe it or not. Boy, he's a sucker for punishment. First, he was defeated at the cross of Christ when Jesus died and rose again on the third day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He was defeated. His energy and his power was taken. He had no more power over Jesus and he lost the power of death because Jesus took it by rising from the dead. The second defeat that he suffers is the defeat that he suffers when we believe God's truth and walk in God's ways. That is the second defeat that the enemy suffers. We defeat him by living right, by speaking the truth, by praying, by seeking God and being in his presence. That is the other way we defeat. And of course, thirdly in the book of Revelation, you read about the final vanquishing defeat of the enemy when he's cast into the pit of fire. Revelation chapter 20, you can see it. He's cast in and he's cast down forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And in the meantime, he can do you no harm so long as you stay close to God. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen? But if you walk away from God, shin scale Ella. That's a different story. Let me finish off with this. Maybe the band will come up. This is, this is literally the last verse of the day. How do we resist the resistance? James, not, knowing as, not known as Mr. Party Guy and Mr. Happy Guy in the New Testament, the brother of Jesus, writes in his letter to the Christians in the early New Testament church. And he tells them about resisting the devil. And he says something very interesting. He says this. He says, so humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We're told to flee temptation, but to resist the devil. We're told to run away from temptation, but to resist the devil. Why? Because the devil has no power over you other than the power that you give him. By listening to his lies and walking in his ways. That's the only way that you give him power. By entertaining him and letting his thinking become your thinking. But if you resist him, you say, no, I'm standing in what God has said about my life, about my future, about my situation. In that, we resist him. No, he's going to go away. He's going to come back again. Don't worry, he'll, he'll find some other route in. But even then, again, we just resist because he has no power of his own over the life of the Christian other than the power we give him. And that is how we resist the resistance of the devil against us. But most importantly, he says this, come close to God and God will come close to you. And when you're close to God, the devil is not in sight, brothers and sisters. When you come close to God, the enemy flees. He goes away because he doesn't hang around where the light is. Now for some of you here this morning, I know that when I was talking about the lies, the lies that you've heard and that are spoken and are echoing around in your mind, I know that for you it is a reality. Even now you may have had lies spoken about you. This might be a very live situation for you. Or maybe in your life from many years ago, like me, 45 years ago, somebody spoke a lie that still bounces around in my head and I can quote it verbatim. Maybe today we're going to say, Lord, we accept your truth over the enemy's lies.